Is it on? Yeah. OK, maybe we'll start slowly. So um, first of all, I wanted to have a little digression. I wanted to show a picture. Just because uh, for, from Amy's yesterday question, yesterday I mentioned that there are uh, minimal but not uniquely ergodic. So that means there are interval exchange maps whose orbits are uh, dense but not uniformly distributed. So in the rotation, if you have something which is dense, it's automatically also uniformly distributed as we did last week. So this is not a picture of an interval exchange orbit. It's a picture of a billiard. So uh, so what is a billiard? Maybe I need my pointer. You just have a, a rectangle, and this rectangle has a slit, a barrier in the middle, and then you look at the trajectory of a point which moves in a straight line and bounces at the boundary, and the boundary it reflects. So when it hits the boundary, it reflects. And uh, this is just a plot of a trajectory, and I hope it's just visually you can believe that this trajectory is dense, so it will go in all parts of the table, but it will not uh, equidistribute. So it, you see there are some areas which are gray, dark gray, and some areas which are white. So these are areas where the trajectory spends more time, and these are areas where it spends less time. So just visually, I think you can believe that this trajectory doesn't feel uniformly uh, according to Lebesgue, it doesn't fill uniformly the, the, the table. And uh, there is a way to build, this trajectory is built upon uh, using interval exchanges, which are minimal but not uniquely ergodic. So there is a nice way, which is out of my lecture scope, but there's a nice way to reduce billiards in polygons to linear flows on translation surfaces. So you can do something called unfolding it, get a translation surface, take the Poincare recession, and these trajectories are governed, are, are related to IETs. So minimal, not uniquely ergodic IETs are behind this picture. This was really a digression. Uh, so what did I do here? OK. So now let's go back to our Rosevich induction. I put up this slide just for memory. I don't want to go any more into uh, the detail of this algorithm, but let me repeat what we have. So. Rosevich induction. So we start from an interval exchange, which is given by a permutation and some length datum. And there are two standing assumptions. We assume that the permutation is irreducible. And we assume that the length of the exchanged intervals are rationally independent. So this is somehow our uh, irrationality. And this Keen theorem tells us that under this condition, orbits will be dense. OK, mi minimality. And maybe let me make two remarks that I didn't do yesterday, but some people asked me in the questions. Uh, OK, so uh, no, maybe let me, before the remarks, let me add uh, some more. So I have this minimum. Uh, and then I, the, the algorithm, this algorithm gives me uh, a sequence of nested intervals. These are nested shrinking intervals. And it gives me a sequence of induced maps. which are all the IETs. And a step of this algorithm is what we did yesterday. You look the shorter interval from at the end, you cut it and induce. And then you continue doing this. So maybe I have another visual picture of the algorithm. Uh, let's put this up. So you start from IET, and then you build smaller and smaller and smaller intervals by this procedure of cutting until uh, so they are nested and they're shrinking. And uh, you look at the induced maps on these smaller intervals, which are all interval exchange maps. This is like a picture you should have in mind. 
And now let me make the remarks. The remarks was that uh, this condition of irrationality, well, let's start. So the assumption star of irrationality actually implies two things. It implies that the algorithm never stops. Algorithm is well defined. Doesn't stop. And when could it stop? You remember we were comparing the last two intervals. There was a, a alpha top and the length of alpha bottom. So, so this equality, if I had equality, maybe I'll go back again. If I had equality between the last two intervals, I could not decide which one is shorter. So equality never occurs. Okay? So, so this, this maybe I should write it at some stage, at some stage n. So there's never ambiguity. There's always a larger or a smaller interval, so I can continue forever. And I don't know, if you try to do, I think I gave this as an exercise yesterday. If you have irrational lengths, you cannot have connections. You cannot have orbits of discontinuities which intersect. And this really tells you that there are never equal intervals in the process. And the second thing that someone correctly pointed out, it also gives me that the size of these intervals goes to zero. It's shrinking to zero, okay? This sort of, and that's gonna be important today. And I also want to make some philosophical remark, because if you were here last week, this will sound very familiar to what I said exactly last Friday. So we have this induction procedure where I look at smaller pieces and induce my IT on the small piece. So associated to this induction procedure, there is a renormalization There's a renormalization map. So given t, r or n of t, I'm defining the orbit either this uh, renormalization, and maybe this renormalization goes from d i t s uh, to d i t s. <coughs> What do I do? If to do Rn, I'm going to write it in words. I, uh, this is actually t to the n, uh, rescaled. Rescaled to unit lengths. So the picture is that you have an IT, you go to a small scale, and you have an induced map. And then what do you do? You just uh, zoom it back. Oh, maybe my picture is. Oh. Uh, maybe let me do it a little bit higher. Sorry. So you have this small interval, IN, and you have this induced map. And you just make your interval length one again. So you open it up to length one. So maybe. Uh, something like this. You take the same picture, and this is going to be 1 over, so basically you multiply by 1 over the length, so to make it length 1. And then here you will see Rn of t. Okay? So every time you have this induction procedure, if the induced object is of the same nature of the original object, this time it's an IT, I can just make it length 1 and have a map called renormalization from space of IT to space of IT. And it's really like last week. Last week we had induced rotations, and we were rescaling them, and we had a renormalization on rotations. And is actually, this, if you do this for, um, if you do this procedure for a rotation, uh, when d is equal to 2, you will not get exactly the same than last week. You will get a slow version of what we were doing last week. I will give you an exercise. If you try Rosevich induction on two intervals, you will get something which behaves like the Fare map. 
And if you, uh, you can actually accelerate, you can do, for example, all top, uh, all cases top together, and then you will get exactly the Gauss map. So there is a relation. You can think of last week's example as a, a special case of an acceleration of this uh, uh, induction. And let me say again, before we'll do some real example, what is the philosophy? The philosophy is always that to study, you can, you can study, uh, you can study uh, this renormalization as a dynamical system. So, uh, so maybe you can, uh, you can study R, study R as a dynamical system. And the properties of the orbit under R of your IT give you some information about the dynamics and the properties of T. And we will see an example late in, in today. But this I wanted to say the picture before we go into it. And the same type of features we saw last week with the Gauss map. Okay. So I would like to, uh, to do some examples of how this renormalization is useful. I need yet one ingredient. And the next ingredient are uh, towers. Towers representation. And again, if you were here last week, you will recognize something very similar to what we did last week. And I really did uh, towers for the rotation in preparation of this picture. Okay. So let's look at my induced map. And uh, let's look at one induced uh, interval. So given I and alpha. Maybe I'll draw this picture. I have one of the intervals exchanged. I and alpha. So what happens if I apply this I to A and alpha, my interval exchange map? My interval exchange map will map my interval out of my space for quite some time. So maybe it will move around. And at some point, it will come back. At some point, it will come back uh, by the induced map. So let me write like this. So let h and alpha be the first return time. Uh, I, so this is, this is the minimum, k greater or equal than one, such that t to the k, and notice I'm applying t, t to the k of i, and alpha uh, is contained in I n. <coughs> so again, I uh, uh, maybe uh, notice, uh, so if I apply T, I, I'm doing the Poincare map, so I don't immediately come back. It takes me some time to come back. And uh, in this setup, if you want uh, h, so t to the n, by definition, restricted to i and alpha is indeed equal to t to the h n of alpha, okay? So the induced map, it's really t to the first return time. And now I want to represent um, the images of my interval up to the first return as a tower. So maybe let me say, let h and alpha, this would be the union of ti of i and alpha, that's i tk. 
the k of i and alpha for k that goes from 0 to h and alpha minus 1. So I'm looking at all the images up to the time they come back, OK? And this I call a tower. This is the tower over uh, I and alpha. And this is a disjoint union. You can convince yourself by definition of first return, you can prove that these are disjoint. They are just all these images, but I want to draw them at the tower. So I want to draw them stacked up on top of my interval. So this is my liter i and alpha. And I want to draw floors of a tower of height h and alpha. Okay. Throw them stacked up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, what's going on? Uh, it's just uh, we had. Uh, if you were here last, last week, we were doing exactly the same for the rotation. This picture has no uh, meaning unless it's a graphical representation. I'm plotting these uh, floors as a tower, but. Uh, um, it, I, I'm going to use this picture to give a representation of the original dynamics in terms of the induced map. So maybe let me remark that if you take the union of the towers, this is going to be equal to everything. And this is an exercise or something we discussed last week. In general, you need some assumption like, well, I mean, don't discuss that, but in this case, it's true. Uh, if a union, and these are the union over, there are d towers, one per letter. And let me plot now the picture of my whole space. This is I n, have maybe different size intervals. So for each interval, I draw the tower over it. And I'm going to draw it like this to understand something. And then I have another one over the, maybe this interval, sorry. And you can put them distance one, but it doesn't matter. It's just a graphical plot. And I have one more. OK? So each tower, each color is the tower. Uh, Let's do it to purple one. Each is a tower of this form. H and alpha is the tower. And the base is uh, I and alpha. And the height is the return time, H and alpha. Maybe return time. Well, if you include the base, there are H and alpha floors. And we saw this picture for the rotation. And we saw that we can read a lot of properties of the dynamics uh, from this picture. So but let me first re stress again, how, what, is, what does this picture mean? So and then in this picture, in this picture, t, how does t act? t uh, moves each floor up. up by 1. So in this picture, by definition, each next floor is image of the previous. And what happens when I get to the top of the tower? Yeah, I believe you were all here. Huh? So I start from, I mean, I'm defining, so the base has the induced map t to the n. Now I'm saying that this picture of stack towers represent the whole space. So the whole space can be represented like this. And on the whole space, I have the action of t. How does it look like? If I take a point in some floor, it will go to the a point above 
but by definition of how I represented the stacking. And when I get to the top, and everybody who was here and did some exercises last week, when I get to the top, T moves me back to the base according to the induced map. So at the top, at the top floor, uh, T moves back, back to base by T to the N. go to the side to make some space. Okay, so this picture you should recognize is very similar to what we have for rotations. And I claim that really a lot of properties of interval exchange maps can be only proven, I think, using this picture. And I would like to give you two examples now. So I want to give two applications of how renormalization is useful and how this induction and towers are useful. So, but first it's a good moment to stop. Do you all think, feel you understand what's going on? Do you, if this tower picture, because last week I know for the towers, at the beginning for the rotation it wasn't clear to everybody, hopefully you had time now to understand. But if you have a question now, stop me before I go on. Clear what I'm doing? I'm inducing and representing the whole map as a tower over the induced map. It's a very standard pro procedure in dynamics, actually. I'm doing it in this very special case, but inducing and, re and uh, uh, representing the space as towers is used in, uh, also in hyperbolic dynamical systems. It's used in many other sets up. And this, in, this, uh, in this picture here, uh, this is, um, these towers are, uh, okay, are related to finite trunk dynamical systems and cutting and stacking. And again, the algorithm, you can see it as cutting and stacking of towers, like we did for the rotation. So it's also quite a general concept in dynamics. And we are doing it in this special case, but you, if you might encounter it again if you continue working in dynamics. Okay, and now uh, application one. Application one. I want to prove that no IET is mixing. And this, I said, it's a result by Katok. <clears throat> so, if I ask you to prove that the rotation is not mixing, I think you all did it last week, it's quite easy to see that the rotation doesn't mix. I have a set, I move it around, it will miss my other, some other set infinitely often. If I ask you to show that an IT is not mixing, I personally don't know how to see it. The dynamics, how do you plot? I don't know how to see it unless you think of an IT in terms of towers. So I can, but on the towers, I think you see it very well. And it's really this finitely many towers, which is key to have this property. So let me try to sketch it. So uh, take a set. I want to find the set for which take A is equal to B with measure of A Lebesgue measure, so not mixing with respect to Lebesgue. So Lebesgue measure of A is less than 1 over D times D plus 2. This is the number of intervals. And this will become, why I choose it like this will become clear at the end. So this, these towers, we said, uh, are getting uh, thinner and thinner because the size shrink to zero. So this uh, little, and they actually cover the whole space. So they actually give you a partition of the space into floors and the mesh goes to zero. So maybe like Amy's density, maybe your simplified Lebesgue density or some approximation argument. Let me say that when N is large, I can assume, uh, so let's say A is almost, with a small error, is almost union of floors, of floors of towers H and alpha. Okay? You can approximate it with floors. So, <coughs> 
So I have my towers, and I can think that my A is a union of full floors, right? It is not really, it's almost, but let me ignore this detail. You can work out there will be an epsilon error, and I leave you to, 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 to fill some details if you want to do it. Let's say that it is a union of floors, okay? That is up to epsilon. So then, so choose, there will be, there exists an alpha such that so there are d towers. We can use pigeon hole principle. There will be one tower which will contain uh, good mass. There will be an alpha such that the measure of A intersecting H and alpha is greater than one over D, the measure of alpha, right? One tower will have more than one over D. There are D towers. One of them has to fit one over D of the mass. OK? Uh, so we'll fix this alpha. And now we look at induced map of the original interval exchange on I and alpha, on the base of that tower, of this tower. Uh, I redraw this tower. I have a tower which has a definite proportion of A somewhere, and I look at the base. Uh, I look at the base, and I look at, uh, uh, I induce my interval exchange on my base. And you all did, uh, you did, some of you might have done the exercise. If I induce an interval exchange on some intervals, I get an interval exchange or at most d plus two intervals, right? So, so uh, since it's a, uh, uh, an IT of at most d plus two intervals, there exists a subinterval J. There exists a J. Uh, actually, let me call it. Okay, there exists a, a J inside I and alpha. There exists a small interval, um, which is a continuity interval for the induced map, and which is I can pick the largest with uh, uh, length the back measure greater than. 1 over d plus 2, the length of i alpha. Uh, there is one, inter one of the induced intervals is bigger than 1 over d plus 2. One of the intervals of the induced map. And this induced map, it comes with a return time. And uh, there is, uh, uh, and, first, uh, and there is an r, rn, a return time such that t to the rn of j is back in i and alpha. And now, now this is the most subtle point. So now I would like you to really look at, maybe I'll do this picture big. I have my tower, and I have some small interval j, which in time uh, t to the rn is back in uh, is back in my in my uh, base. Okay. So now pick some other floor. Then you should really look at the picture. So pick some other floor and pick the little interval above j. So what happens if I flow this? I, I iterate t rn times to this. So the base comes back in time rn. But once uh, the base comes back, it actually uh, keeps flowing up. 
So what do you know about this interval? It will come back and then uh, flow back exactly to the same height. So this is what I don't think I can write anything. I think I want you to think what happens to this small interval. I write you the claim and then you can meditate. I claim for every floor, for every floor of F in, in this tower, if I look at T R N of F, uh, Uh, intersected with F, I claim that uh, the Lebesgue measure of this intersection is at least 1 over D plus 2, the, the Lebesgue measure of the floor. Rn. So if I look at my floor, it contains my one small interval above j, and this small interval will come back at the same floor. So the floor will self-intersect at least into the, to, through this small interval of size 1 over d plus 2. Uh, uh, so the idea is that you have inside f, you have uh, this small interval, you have uh, a small interval of size 1 over d. And this small interval comes back on the same floor. So the whole floor self-intersects. I think I, I, I maybe I should, uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave you to meditate on this point because you really have to stare at the picture of the tower and understand the small intervals come back in that time. So the whole floor, when it comes back, will self-overlap on something of that area. And from here, going back to A, you can also deduce that if I look at my set A, which was union of floors, the Lebesgue measure of A intersected with TRN of A, this is greater than actually, okay, this again, I'm not want to finish all the details because, but the, the measure of A intersected with TRA will be actually equal, less, greater than d over d plus 2, the measure of a. Why? So d has, uh, sorry, a has a 1 over d proportion in this tower, and every floor in this tower, in particular the a floors, when they come back, they self-intersect with a proportion 1 over d plus 2. So this d and d plus 2, this is the proportion of A in H and alpha. And this is the self-intersection of each floor. Okay? And now I would like to show you that this contradicts mixing. So, but if mixing, if T were mixing, the measure of T to the Rn of A intersected with A we has to tend to mu A squared uh, as N tends to infinity. You should see as n tends to infinity, my return times are getting larger and larger, so mixing should hold. But these two cannot hold together. So this would give, uh, together with that, it would give that the measure of A is greater than 1 over uh, d, d plus 2 measure of A squared. Uh, but you can, uh, sorry, did I do something wrong? Uh, measure of A squared is greater than measure of, so you simplify an A, this is the contradiction with the choice of A. If A is small, this cannot, I chose A at the beginning sufficiently small, so that this is a contradiction. Okay? So, so I don't know if you, uh, if I managed to convey all the details, but I, the picture I, I want to leave you is that from this tower picture, you can understand a lot of the dynamics of T, and you can see things that you cannot see uh, with your naked eye. Okay, and maybe I try to convey one more. 
one more application. Application two. And this is a baby sketch of unique ergodicity. So I want to say the true towers and renormalization you can understand in variant measures. So let me start with some uh, uh, elementary observation. So say that mu is a T invariant measure, potentially different than the Lebesgue measure. So you can remark that, OK, uh, let me give a uh, let, so okay, maybe let me uh, for the remark, define the following vectors. Define mu n alpha, or define the following quantity. Mu n alpha is the measure of the interval i n alpha. OK? I look at the measure of the uh, uh, small intervals in my induction. And the remarks, looking at the towers, I can see that all floors uh, have the same measure, because my measure is invariant. So all floors in uh, uh, H and the tower H and alpha have measure, mu measure uh, mu alpha n. And the other thing that you can remark from the fact that towers give you partitions is that if I know the measure on all the floors of all the towers at every stage, I completely determine the measure. So remark one was this. So if I know the base numbers, I know all the floors measures. And uh, if I know mu and alpha for every alpha, and for every n, they fully determine they fully determine mu. Okay. This is just because partitions are generating. Partitions are made by floors which uh, shrink to zero. So they can approximate any other measurable set with floors, exactly like I did with A. And now there is a key point. So I wish I had, I didn't bring the slide from yesterday, sorry. So yesterday, so yesterday what did we prove? Or maybe you tried to, if you proved the exercise, one of the exercises uh, that I gave, we proved that the length of the intervals satisfy some matricial relation. You remember this? When we do this algorithm, these are matrices given by the algorithm. And uh, I don't have the slides from yesterday, unfortunately. But uh, uh, yeah, OK. So when we were doing the algorithm, we were recording how the length of the intervals change at each step. And we saw that you need to multiply some matrices. And these matrices are each of the form like some ones with some on the diagonal and out of diagonal one. So uh, uh, I don't have the last slide from yesterday. It takes too long to put it up. OK, so maybe I'll just go back to one step of the algorithm. You know, there was a relation between uh, something like this. You had like something like I, D. In this picture, it was like I, D, uh, N was equal to I, A, N plus 1 plus I, A, uh, I, D, N plus 1, right? One interval was uh, sum of two, and this gave you one of these matrices. And this gives you that the lengths satisfy this relation. Uh, lambda d n plus one. But also that other measures have to satisfy 
these constraints. Because if I have a measure of the sum of the union of two intervals, it has to be the sum. It also gives you that mu and d has to be equal to mu a n plus 1 plus lam mu. It's always also true for the mu measures. So also mu has to satisfy a similar relation. Mu 0, so the vector with mu 0 alpha as entries. Let me write it like this, sorry. sorry. Mu 0, which is a vector with entry mu 0 alpha. These are the measures of the base. Also satisfies a n, a 1 of uh, mu 0 alphas, OK? So they satisfy the same recursive formulas. Ah, sorry, sorry. N and no, it's the same, like here. So I do it inductively. So the previous is a matrix. Ah, no, no, you're right. Thank you so much, Amy. You're right, it should be the same. It starts with the outer and goes through the inner, like this. Thank you, Amy. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Amy, because I will confuse everybody when I don't know what it says. Okay. Yes, it's exactly the same formula with the mu's, okay? Great. And now, now I want to, uh, now I want to do, now I have to, uh, this is true for any IT, now I want to focus on a special case. Actually, I want to tell you the key, a, a key renormalization uh, fact. Uh, so let me say what we are trying to prove. So the following is true. If the orbit under renormalization of T is recurrent, so if the co uh, recurrent means that my orbit comes back close to my original t infinitely often, uh, this is actually vich. It's I think due to vich. If the orbit is recurrent, I claim that t is uniquely ergodic. And this is really a basic example of this renormalization philosophy. You see, properties of the renormalization orbit tells you something about the dynamics of your interval exchange. So this is a property of the renormalization map. I have an orbit which comes back. And this is a property about the point I'm starting to normalize. And I will give you the proof in a baby case. Proof in a baby case which is t periodic, which is Rn of t is equal to t. So periodic or periodic induction, or which basically tells you that t is in some self, self similar. So this is the analogous of rotation numbers of quadratic irrational rotation number, where the Gauss map is periodic. This is like periodic points for the Gauss map. Those are periodic IT for the renormalization. And that means self-similar. And what happens in this case? So these matrices only depend on the renormalized map. So if my renormalized map is periodic, I claim that the matrices AN uh, repeat periodically. So it will look like a 0, a n minus 1, and then maybe a n, okay, well, that doesn't matter. And then again a 0, a n minus 1, and they will repeat in blocks. And I will call a the block. Okay? I'm almost done. Then I take my uh, formula. I take my formula for mu. 
And what do I get? I get that mu zero. I can write it as uh, I can write it as uh, okay. Let me just write it like this. Is I can write it like this. It's in the intersection of k of a k of some positive number. So maybe I should have done one more step. Uh, okay, maybe let me do one more step. Sorry, let me. Uh, Add one more step. So maybe let me first see. If I use my formula, what do I get? Mu zero is A of mu, let's say, n, the period. Uh, uh, but it's also equal to A times A of mu 2n. And this equal to A to the k of mu kn. I can, I can expand it as long as I want. So for every k, I can write it as a k of some number. And this is my number in r plus to the d. I, I can. And now, now I have to appeal to something which maybe not. Uh, some may have seen, some not. And actually, mm, uh, this matrix A, uh, it has to be, but uh, it actually, this period matrix has positive entries. It's clear that it has no negative entries because I'm multiplying matrices with zero and ones. But actually, when normalization is periodic, I have to multiply enough matrices to see positive entries in the product. And if I apply it to uh, RD, it actually uh, sends uh, RD, the positive cone in RD, inside itself. So. Uh, it sends the positive cone inside itself. So I want to use some kind of contraction principle, or if uh, some of you know Perron Frobenius theorem, you know that these matrices will have a unique fixed point, and it will have a unique fixed point of uh, unit length, right? So in general, you should picture yourself, my mu has to stay in A of this, but it should also stay in A square of this, but it should also stay in a to the k of r plus to the d. So it actually, by contraction principle, you can prove that this, uh, this matrix contracts the positive cone. So by, by Brouwer fixed point, if you want some form of Brouwer, I can ask you actually to prove an elementary Brouwer fixed point, if you want. Uh, actually, there is a fixed line but I also want my measures to add up to one. There exists a unique mu uh, zero uh, in the simplex in sigma d, such that uh, a of uh, such that uh, 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 this equation holds. Let me write star holds, which has this form. Uh, and and I know that lambda and mu are solutions, so lambda has to be equal to mu. And this is a step zero. But now you can transport with your equations. Uh, this is also going to be true at every other step by applying, uh, applying, uh, applying the, my matrices. I apply the inverses of the matrix. Once the initial vector is determined, everything is determined. And by some remark, initial remark, uh, mu is Lebesgue. They coincide on all tower floors. Okay, that was a long, a long picture. But I thought I wanted to, to, to try to give you at least one example of this renormalization machinery. I gave you two, so the towers are helpful. 
and uh, uh, to prove things like mixing. You can look at the dynamics in the towers. And uh, renormalization is helpful to study. And uh, I just want to conclude with the picture, because I, uh, if I, uh, um, and this maybe I will skip, I will, let me go. You can do something else. You can also study Birkhoff sums functions. Uh, OK, let me say. You can also do something else. You can study uh, Birkhoff sum. So you can take, a, sorry, maybe a functions, uh, say a piecewise constant function, and plot the Birkhoff sum over an interval exchange. I just want to show you a simulation. So you take a, a point and you plot f of x, f of t, t of x, f of t square of x, and you plot them on a graph. Say that you graph the Birkhoff sums of some function. So you plot as time, as their horizontal axis move, values of a Birkhoff sum of a function, and then connect the dots, and stop at n and connect the dot, and maybe map everything into 0, 1. So I just want to conclude with leaving this picture. This is how the plot of a Birkhoff sum over an of a function over an interval exchange looks like. So I'm just plotting a Birkhoff sum. And now look at this picture and tell me what do you see? What does this look to you? To me, this looks a little bit like a fractal, doesn't it? It looks like a little bit similar. So all another word of renormalization, you can go to study functions, Birkhoff sums, and renormalization can explain this picture. Renormalization can tell you that some pieces are made by smaller pieces, which are made by smaller pieces. And what are these basic pieces? They could be Birkhoff sums up to the height of a tower. So if you plot a Birkhoff sum up to a tower, it gives you a block. But then the towers cut and stack. So the Birkhoff sums combine with each other to make a picture. So they don't, I, uh, I cannot go into this, but I just want to tell you that there's a lot of possibilities. And pictures like this, when you see this picture, you see renormalization. You see that there is a phenomenon that you can explain. And lots of dynamics of interval exchanges and beautiful pictures like this can be explained through this machinery. Right? Thanks.